Uh, Danny Kilkenny is actually the newest member of the development team. He's been working mostly on a lot of the visualization stuff, um, trying to learn his way around our visualization code. He's gonna be showing you a new visualization technique or a new visualization tool that, that we developed that is not at all our idea. Um, I, John Yasa gave us the original prototype that we based all of our work on. I've since been told that like the jump program has the exact same functionality built into it. Uh, so it seems like this is a pretty standard way to visualize surrogate models. But uh, regardless, if you don't like this function, it's John Yasa's fault. Uh, so complain to him. It's not Danny's fault. Danny just did what we told him. Uh, but Danny did take the code that John gave us, which wasn't good, because it was the first thing he like, ever wrote in Python. He's a much better coder now, though. Um, and he rewrote the entire thing in Bokeh. So this is us trying like a slightly different visualization tool. The, the other thing was just pure JavaScript. This is Bokeh, which is like a Python library that ultimately writes the JavaScript for you. Yeah, OK. So I didn't get that wrong. So with that, I'll let him show you guys our new metamodel visualization tool, which was born out of me watching a couple of people get bad meta models or have bad meta models that like ruined their models and they didn't know what was going on. So this tool is designed to like help you not have that problem or at least know when you have that problem. Maybe that's a better, yeah. a better way to say it. <laughs> All right, thanks. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna tell you guys a little bit about uh, this meta model viewer uh, tool. Uh, I'm just gonna give you a quick overview of surrogate models, how you used to check them um, and then two examples of how you can look at them now. Uh, so surrogate models, just in a general sense, if you haven't dealt with them or don't know what they are, um, it is a way to interpolate um, the interpolate values between known data points. So if you've gone out and gotten, let's just say, atmospheric conditions uh, at a thousand feet, two thousand feet, three thousand feet, some something like that, you might want to know what what might my atmospheric conditions might be at fifteen hundred or twenty five hundred feet. So using surrogate models, you can make predictions uh, or you can make yeah, predictions estimates of what those conditions might be in the in-between points. Um, so I'm purposely not giving you like a really good uh, visual example because that's what we did with the new, uh, with the new tool. So the old way we did it, uh, you can find this example online uh, in the documentation is, uh, is a way, is how we used to check it. So, what you do is, uh, so we're just P1 through three is just creating some fake training data. Um, and then F is our output data. Um, and so what we do is put it in, in this instance, it's a structured meta model. Um, our method is just a S linear, just a linear interpolation. Uh, we're gonna add those, we're gonna add P1 through three as our training, training inputs uh, for the model to accept as known data points and then to be, uh, to to have predictions made in between them. Next, we're going to provide the output, which you can see here. Uh, we're just calling that F. And then we add it to a group, uh, add the subsystem in, and we set up the problem, uh, problem reference. So where you see the set inputs, uh, you'll see that we have P1, 2, and 3. Uh, and we're making, we're making two prediction points. Um, one at you know, 55, negative two, and 0.323, uh, and then another another prediction at 12, three, and 0.5. Uh, so if you run that, you will get the answer of uh, 6.73 and 5.2. Um, so that was the old way. You kind of look at that, you test it at different points, you test it your known data points to make sure that that would line up, and then you test it at unknown points. Um, and so you kind of have to just get a mental image of whether you thought your surrogate model was fitting or not. Um, and so that isn't a very effective way to check out models. So luckily, we can move into a structure, structured example. Um, so this is all made up data. It's kind of like whose line is it anyway? Data is all made up and points don't matter. Um, but uh, a couple, our, our examples here uh, we have uh, lens space from uh, 100 to 600, and, and the second is 0 to 15,000 feet. Uh, the T data would be our output data. With a structured meta model, you have to give it a grid of data. Uh, it can't be random points. It has to be a x by x grid. So in this case, it's a 7 by 7 grid. Uh, like before, we add, it to, uh, we add a problem. 
some end up end of var comps add the subsystem add the input and the output and we're ready to go so we're going to move over here to the command line uh, and so we're going to check out the open mdao uh, command or commands for view and then and just to give you an example of what the view mm uh, dash h will give you let me increase the font to that all right uh, so all you really need to do is give it a file you can optionally give it resolution uh, a resolution value if you want a higher resolution contour plot which you'll see in a minute um, but let's let's show you what it looks like Uh, give it a flag M, or actually, hold on. So this is going to produce an error. Uh, it's going to say meta model wasn't specified. So in my file, we have two meta models. Um, and so this vision, or this uh, through the command line, it'll actually be able to recognize and determine if you have more than one um, surrogate model. And then it'll prompt you to choose which one you want to actually view. If you only have one, it'll just automatically default to the one you have and show it to you. So to do that, you give it a dash M flag, and then you call out what, what the name of it is. And so in our case, it's just called MM. <laughs> Let me just, uh, all right, can everyone see that? Yes. Okay. So just to give you a little kind of descriptor of what you're seeing here. First, you're seeing the contour plot with a 50 by 50 prediction grid. So it runs pre for the default is 50. Um, so it gives you predictions, uh, a 2,500 predictions to create this contour plot. The gray dots you see hanging around uh, in a grid fashion here are your known, known training points. Um, the color bar shows you how deep or how far out the Z axis is going in or out of, uh, out of plane of your computer monitor. On the bottom and, and right side, you'll see some subplots and that's showing you slice views of your contour plot. So if I move airspeed to here, uh, you know, kind of that midpoint around there, you'll notice the black line shows you uh, where that cut line is, and then it'll it will show you the projection view of it onto your right plot here. Uh, consequently, if you do it um, in the y direction, it'll also show you the cut line projected onto the bottom plot. The points you see on the bottom and right subplot are your training points, and that's just showing you how near or far they are to your surrogate model line, which is your blue line. So like I said, when I made those predictions at you know X, Y, and Z, and that number that came out, it's doing that, it's, uh, it's giving you a 50, uh, a 50 dot, or it's giving you a line plot of those predictions. Uh, on the right, you'll see airspeed and altitude. Those are your two uh, X and Y inputs uh, in this case. You can always change those through the drop downs here. Uh, you can flip them around in any way, shape, or form you'd like to. Uh, same with output. If you have two outputs or three outputs, you can change that up as well. Yes. Yeah. So if I move it over towards here, you'll see it. Uh, you'll see it move closer to those lines, and as you move further away from it. The, the distance between these lines isn't too isn't far enough to show a significant uh, reach between but as as I move between the different points you can see yes yes and so the other thing too is in the scatter distance you can change that so right now we have it at point one and that's about 10 percent uh, if we changed it to point five which would be 50 percent oops Hold on one second. You can see more of your training data. Is there an option to show standard error in percentage or absolute value? No. 
Not right now. Not right now, but that's uh, something we can look into. Um, so just a couple last points on this plot. Around here might be satisfactory to you, uh, but in this area around here, it might go, okay, so from about uh, 180 onward in airspeed, it's looking good. I'm happy with my surrogate model fit. Uh, but I want some more definition around 108, uh, between 100 and 200. What you can do is you can change the method if you'd like to. Uh, so we have chemo splines in here as well. Um, so you can change that and rerun it. And you'll get a third order uh, spline fit. But this also gives you a great example of maybe I just need more training data in there. Um, and so we've gone through and collected more training data and we're switched to MM2. And you can see that we did need more training, training information or more data points at that uh, between 100 and 200 to really define our design or to, to define our space. Um, so this is a great example of how using our tool can help you view your surrogates and find out maybe I need more training data at those points, or maybe I need a better fit. Maybe I need a third order or second order, first order uh, spline fit. So that's it for the structured meta model. Uh, I'm going to show you an example on unstructured meta models. Uh, really only one of the main differences is it could be, it can be random data points anywhere in your design space uh, and it'll show those. So let me bring that up. And so again, just to reiterate, I'll show you that the error will pop up and say, oh, you didn't specify one of your, uh, one of your uh, meta models. Uh, so this, is, this data is cur also courtesy of John Yasa. Uh, so appreciate him letting us use this. Uh, and this is a great example of how you don't always need a gridded structure of data, uh, gridded structure of data. Um, while this still kind of could be considered a grid of data, uh, it is random indeed. Um, you could put points anywhere you want to in there um, and unstructured will be able to handle it. So right now we're using the nearest neighbors, um, nearest neighbors method or rather uh, default surrogate. And so again, same things apply. Your cut lines can be moved around at any point you want. Uh, your inputs could be changed. So in this case, we could change it to altitude versus alpha. And you might get some crazy value there, um, but it's up to you to decide what you want your, which, which you want in your visualizer. And finally, you can also change your output like we talked about before in this case, we do have more than one output, so we change from coefficient of lift to coefficient of drag. Uh, and then finally, again, to reiterate, scatter distance can be changed to 0.5 so you can see more of your data. Um, I'm going to reset this real quick and just show you. So with nearest neighbors, you might look at this and go, once again, lacking definition around this area, maybe around here too. Uh, but I'm happy with this section. So I'm going to go out, get some more data, uh, and and bring some more definition to this. And maybe I also want to change it to uh, Krieging as well. So Krieging is the most computationally expensive um, algorithm in our surrogate list. Uh, so Typically, these models do take a little bit longer to run. Um, however, they'll generally they generally will give you a better fit, but that's up to you to determine with your models. Uh, so, finally, as you can see, that added training data did help give us a more defined uh, visualization of our training data. So, ironically enough, I have a question. Um, when you did that dash m Krieging, are you like changing the default surrogate? No. So dash m is those are just the names that I named my surrogate so i could have named it oh so that file had args in it yeah it was arg parsing okay yeah so i, I could I, my, it could it could be interp one and interp two and that could be your surrogate names but that's um, not part of meta model viewer that was part of the script 
So no, so dash M, uh, if you have more than one surrogate model in there, like oh. then you say, so I want it. Oh, I've got you two had names. one that was got it, got it. Yeah, yeah. So that that was the yes. name of the meta model component. Yeah, not so, you weren't like changing the surrogate that was being used on the same set. So of data. yeah, for okay. example, I just call this nearest neighbor. I could call this interp one if I wanted to. And then in the in the command line, it would say, oh, you didn't name it. It's Kriegian and interp one, for instance. It's whatever the name of that uh, of your of your. Uh, Is it the name of the attribute or the name when you add it to the model? The name of the attribute. Oh, all right. The name of the model. Yes, it's whatever whatever training data you have to add to it, it can accept, and it'll um, whatever you name it in in an add input. Uh, or am I am I misinterpreting? Yeah, Brett disagrees with me. Scroll down a little bit to where you actually add it to the model. It's those names, the add subsystem names, nearest neighbor and oh. Kriegen. Okay, sorry. So whatever the attribute name is doesn't matter. It's it's the model name, the comp the name of the model component. Yeah. It's you can go up to as many dimensions as you want to, inputs and outputs, as many as you want to. Yeah. Assuming you have enough training data, that's yeah. on you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Not yet. Not not yet. It's a good idea though. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great idea. It's we don't we don't have that in there right now, but that's uh, definitely an interesting idea because yeah, that's I think a key thing people would be using this for. Yeah. The, no, the Krieging surrogate itself. You're talking about the the yeah the output there is there, but it's not hooked up to the meta model viewer. You're talking about the Krieging computing like the standard deviation of its prediction. The math is in the Krieging surrogate, but it's not hooked. That that information is not available to this viewer. We could add something like that, yeah, for form, you know, non-deterministic models. I've seen the 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 ones that like ASDL makes and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're thinking you would do something like that just for the surrogate model? Okay. So that would be another way to visualize like all of your cert, like if you had five outputs in the component. Right, right, okay. It's interesting. Yeah, so we've, we've tended to use this functionality to like if you have some drag surrogate or something for an aircraft and you're not happy, like one time we were doing like fitting air, airfoil data and the surrogate dipped to like negative CD. And of course the optimizer found that point because of course it would. And so like, okay, we, we figured like, you got to pinpoint some specific area of the surrogate where you're not happy with. But we haven't thought about using this for like rigorous surrogate validation, which is kind of the ideas that you guys have been talking about. Um, but maybe those are good things to add, add to it, yeah. Which iteration? I Which made him time? do it three yeah. times. <laughs> <laughs> it's like an open MDAO all in one. Uh, I don't know, three, four weeks? Yeah, yeah, about about four. About four weeks on the final attempt. Uh, when I was just curious, how many dimensions do you have? As many as you want. I mean, that this this doesn't this doesn't have a limit because basically you you choose your X and Y axis and then everything else like you just pick a value for and it's like projecting it. How many dimensions you have training data for, that's not my problem. <laughs> Most I've tried is with like 10. So we just did 10 inputs and I think it was five or six outputs. Uh, but it's, yeah, so yeah it's, all, it's all what you, yeah, like you said, what you have training data for. But, but you're, you're always gonna just look at a 2D projection and then all the other dimensions, you just set the value.
like a like a that's kind of closer to what he was describing with his profile plot. Um, that's basically what they're showing you. Uh, we haven't considered it. My fear would be it's too much to understand, but we could try it. Yeah. Well, that's basically what you would get if you move that, that alpha slider there. That's basically what you get. So it's re it's repredicting. It's re going through all those twenty five hundred points and making predictions again for you for a new uh, contour plot. Yeah, so one of the like one of the fundamental questions I have for you guys right now this is actually like it's running through a server right. It's using this bokeh library, but I could make Danny rewrite it a fourth time. <laughs> um, <laughs> so so like right now it sort of pre-computes everything for whatever alpha value you pick. And then you, as you move that alpha slider, it re-computes the entire thing. And we do that because, you know, 2,500 points through a surrogate maybe isn't that many, but those creating surrogates are kind of slow. So if, if we had to pre-compute everything for all the alphas, it's a lot of data. But that means that this could never live in the case recorder and be part of like an offline visualization. This is like an online visualization technique. Would you guys rather that, or would you rather like, okay, I'll, I'll spend some time, like half an hour or whatever, computing a, a buttload of a samples through, through the surrogate, and then that all goes into a file, which is part of an offline visualization. I actually don't know the right answer to that. Um, I have like a slight personal preference toward like portability of these visualization tools. So like, you know, Sandy's really bad at making surrogate models and he needs a lot of help. So he sends me the files and I like quickly can pinpoint that, that's useful to me, but that's because I debug a lot of people's models. But maybe you guys would rather just have the online tool and have it be more responsive. Uh, I, don't, I don't need an answer now, but I wanted to sort of put that out there and let you guys uh, postulate it. It's pretty clear what Santiago prefers, res responsiveness, but. Um, too much data? Okay. Do you have a question? Yeah. I'm sorry? Bokeh. Bokeh is the library. Yeah. It's, it's written in Python, Bokeh is the library. Yeah. yeah. No, I haven't seen it. Oh, yeah? Okay. So are you advocating that we run OpenMBO in the browser? <laughs> wow, all right. Okay, all right. My, my gut feeling would be that's too much development for us to bite off on, but. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know that there's that many good visualization tools that are specifically targeted toward like general understanding of the surrogate model. But um, I know of a few, but they're not free. So that's a problem. Like jump is a good one. Uh, but there's a good bit of like needing to tie to some of the structures in OpenMDO. I don't I actually don't know that we could do this in a generic way. But if, if you have a suggestion for like a really good open source tool that already does all of this and we just have to give it the data, I mean, I'd, I'd love to take a look at it. 